I'm, I'm doing the heavy lifting this morning, and then Maxine's going to take over this afternoon, uh, or later this morning. Um, so so uh, welcome to, to our first uh, panel, which is the Evolving Global, global Context for Center-Based Engineering. Um, in this panel, we hope to learn about engineering research uh, in the broader international context. And we have uh, uh, three panelists this morning. Uh, 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 first, uh, Arvind Krishna. Dr. Krishna is Senior uh, Vice President for Global Research at IBM. In this role, he helps guide the company's overall technical strategy, leading a global organization of scientists and technologists. As Academy staff were gearing up for this study, they were particularly impressed by his ideas on the impact of large databases and machine learning in shaping center-based research programs. I should mention that uh, extensive bios of all the uh, panelists as well as all the speakers today are in your uh, handouts, so uh, we're just going to do brief intros here this morning. Uh, our second panelist is Owen O'Sullivan. Dr. O'Sullivan is director of the Center for Science, Technology, and Innovation Policy at the University of Cambridge. He joined the Institute for Manufacturing as a senior policy fellow in 2007 before joining the IFM. Uh, Owen was special advisor to the Director General of Science Foundation Ireland. He's carried out extensive research on the way science and engineering R&D are translated into new technologies, industries, and economic wealth. And uh, finally, we have uh, Jean-Louis Chameau. Uh, Dr. Chameau is a civil engineer and current president of King Abdullah University of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia and is formerly president of Caltech. He's known as an outstanding administrator who has also been a leader in improving the quality of student-faculty relationships and encouraging cross-disciplinary research. And so I believe we're going to start with Dr. Krishna. Thank you. So good morning, everyone, and thank you for having us uh, here. Uh, when we look at uh, the problems, and uh, Dr. Cordova sort of touched on a lot of them, I'm going to motivate it first, and I'll politely disagree with Dr. Kargankar, but in a way that I think he might like. I think the impact of these centers going backwards is not measured in the tens of billions, but probably in the trillions. And, uh, and when you look at it, I'll look at it from a national impact perspective, the economic benefit to the United States can easily be measured there. And I think this will get motivated through the first problem. So when you look at just aging, not all of healthcare, people over 65 are going to double in the next 20 years. That spend, when you include not just healthcare, but the government and societal spend of looking after aging people in homes, mobility, uh, cognitive decline, wealth, fraud, all those aspects that touch upon our lives are measured probably in the two to three trillion range for the United States. And you can easily estimate that today, 20 to 30 percent would be a vast underestimate of the inefficiency in that spend. As an engineer, I look at it and I say, what all can we do? applying all these methods, uh, applying computational techniques, not necessarily those drawn only from high-performance computing, but computational techniques applied to neuroscience, applied to healthcare, applied to wealth management, to enable people to live happier, longer, and making much more effective use of that spend. People don't want to be disabled at the age of 80, even though a vast number tend to live in very constrained environments. So that's sort of a touching point, and that touches, I think, on the question that got raised on the multidisciplinary nature of this, because you're also not going to do that without a whole lot of people addressing all the moral questions that come up uh, in terms of the intrusions that will have to happen if you want that vision to come true. Now, on more uh, uh, near-term notes, um, energy is certainly an example where we can begin to look at this topic. And this is not touching on ideology, so whether it's carbon-based or non-carbon-based. I'm going to say, as an industry guy, I'm completely neutral on that topic. So if you look at the uh, smart grids, 150 petabytes of data, that's coming just from smart meters. Multiple times that number, if you begin to include the actual grid distribution generation from both conventional and non-conventional sources. What exactly are we doing with all that today? Not, not very much, I would assert. It's been a vision, in this case, for about a decade. There's been, I'll call it, tiny points of improvement but nothing like what's possible. Now, if you look at any um, oil producer today or exploration, 
a single oil well, whether exploratory or uh, already producing, can produce terabytes of data a day. The vast majority of that is completely discarded, not because they want to discard it, but because they don't know how to use all of it. So we know, we know as scientists, that you can probably improve the outcome of existing wells by 20 to 30 percent. We know that in the current environment of oil, that's something very appealing to them. But how do you go about doing all that? And that covers everything from polymer chemistry to how do you retrieve more, uh, to measurements, uh, to knowing where to drill. A single oil well in the Arctic or the deep sea costs in the hundreds of millions, some would assert in the billions. So improving the effectiveness of all of those has very large economic impacts. And if you begin to look at these, what comes up in all of these? Why, why are all these problems relevant today? And why do I believe that they belong in this study? You need data, vast amounts of data that are drawn from all of these disciplines. In order to understand that data, you need uh, both scientists and engineers who live in those domains. Without the domain expertise, you're going to get nowhere. You need the competition that has already been pointed to. You've got exponential increase in computation, albeit uh, even though I'm in that industry, I will say it's pretty much the same model that was discovered or invented in the 1940s. We've taken it to its extreme. I think it's time to come up with new uh, methods of computation. And whether we call it machine learning, AI, cognitive, those techniques, as opposed to only, I'll call it, algebra and calculus taken to the extreme, are going to be essential to be able to make sense of all of these. So, so, so to touch on these, I'll sort of try to very quickly motivate all three aspects. Look, high quality data is a critical resource. If you look at the margins of companies that can get a lock on data, it is tremendous. In order to enable all this, we are going to have to make sure that vast amount of data are available in the open, and I believe that should be a critical outcome of these centers, that they can provide these data uh, qualities uh, out there. You can touch on water quality. Um, you know, Flint, Michigan is certainly in everyone's mind in the United States, but water quality is going to be essential. Uh, California is going through its water reduction right now, and when we look at the waterways in various nations, uh, not just the emerging countries, there is a tremendous amount of this thing to do. We know that putting sensors on water, not just to measure uh, chemicals, but to measure flows, to measure oxygenation, to measure uh, combination, uh, all of these aspects can um, uh, yield uh, tremendous benefits. Not just for the water we drink, by the way. Many industries need vast amount of clean water, all the way from manufacturing to semiconductors, et cetera, and where you can put them will depend upon what we can do on water. Food safety. If you try to get down to biogenomics and you start uh, measuring the genome of a factory, not of a single species or a single cell, it can result in tremendous benefits. But how do we go do this? Um, foodborne illnesses uh, in the United States is $80 billion worth of waste each year. And if you can uh, get them at its source, you can begin to decrease that waste and improve uh, the quality of life. Um, pollution. When you look at uh, pollution, we, certainly people like to measure pollution at the stack. But that doesn't really tell you what's going to happen at, at a national or regional level. Uh, weather was begun as... I'm going to guess as a center-based activity or funded by government 40 or 50 years ago, and today everyone takes it for granted. How about applying the same techniques to pollution? And all of these uh, things that I pointed to will come into play. Um, I'll just touch on one more here. Um, when we look at, there's been a tremendous amount of work on drugs, especially as applied to all physical illnesses. When we look at uh, all forms of cognitive decline, note I'm not talking necessarily just illness, but decline, and if I look at the room and myself, I'll say, look, we'll all sort of face this. Like it or not, we will all face it. And the question is, can you begin to predict it? And if you can predict it in advance of it happening, are there techniques to then mitigate it, allowing us all to function for a lot longer? And I think there's some very exciting advances that are probably, I'll say, around the corner, but it'll need these kind of approaches to go begin to work on them. I'll also take uh, a couple of quick examples, and I'm glad... Uh, our colleague from SRC spoke up because that's not on this page, but it's certainly worth mentioning. I mean, ARPANET, which uh, you could say roots go back to the 60s, and it was a university, industry, and government collaboration. Um, I, I'll tell you, when I was in grad school, um, everyone was beginning to use it. Everyone was beginning to benefit from it. 
And you can see that the industries that span out of it, by the way, just in the United States, if I look, so, so the two that I remember well from an industry perspective are IBM, which is where I worked and we built some of the first routers and BBN who was on the other side and then certainly all the university uh, collaborators. The industries that have spun out from that, you can probably add up their market value, revenue and employment and that itself, that narrow tiny subset, not all the social media benefits will be measured at a trillion dollars or more for this nation. High performance computing, um, certainly while NSF is a player, it's more than NSF and I will say the elements of high performance computing how they have made their way back into both the semiconductor industry and the processor industry and then the computing industry at large is vastly underestimated by the average individual. Many, many of the techniques are experimented on in high performance computing and then trickle their way back because nobody else will take the risk of spending tens or hundreds of billions of dollars without uh, being able to see the path forward. HPC is the only one who's willing to lay out 10 year roadmaps and then go at it. And I would say cognitive computing. And while certainly IBM takes a very strong position on it, it's not just us. It's many others in the industry from Facebook to Microsoft to Amazon to, uh, to Google to name a few, but many, many in uh, academia today are also focusing heavily on it. We can talk about, we are past the two winters of AI into the third rebirth, people will claim fourth. I mean, it doesn't really matter, but I think it's all those aspects of data and compute coming together that are enabling uh, this particular resurgence. And it's a technique that I think is going to uh, lay forward. But I think we need new science. I mean, should I take 3,000 images or 30,000 or 3 million to go train something? I mean, information theorists always measure entropy and not as a vague concept, but as a very precise concept, whether we lay it out to people like Shannon or many others around him, but Shannon sort of crystallized all this. And it told us how much in information theory you needed in order to transmit something. How do I measure the entry for data set? How good is it? How rich is it? How diverse is it? Do I need more or am I at a law of uh, diminishing returns right now? Um, what about anomalies? Um, the amount of stuff that is happening, um, should this computer be talking to somebody else or not? And uh, you gotta do all this in the context of privacy because if we collect these very large data sets, uh, like it or not, you are going to have lots of information. I'll call it side channel. Maybe it's not directly somebody's direct data, but if you have enough data, I am convinced you can go deduce what you want about other people and their ailments. So if that's the case, then how are you going to ensure that this happens? This all requires new science. It doesn't exist today in any of these. Uh, lots of other examples, but uh, I'll leave them there uh, for the deck. And we need to create radically more efficient infrastructure. Uh, we ran an experiment in IBM that was, um, that was funded by DARPA, so we're very grateful for that. FPG, FPGAs and GPUs are here today. I'll say they give you two to four X improvements over traditional compute. That's kind of the order. I'll take it. A four time reduction in cost is wonderful, but does not change the game. It does not change the game. Now, if you look at uh, neuromorphic computing, on this one, we know that we got three orders of magnitude improvement, albeit on a limited set of activities. I will, I will, I will state that. And, but three orders of magnitude suddenly gets a lot more interesting. The human brain takes 20 watts to do video processing. Video processing on traditional compute clusters is in the tens of megawatts if you want to have 99% accuracy for, let's say, traffic down a six-lane highway. Neuromorphic systems were able to do it in the tens of watts. Okay, so we got a wonderful proof point that this is possible. But if I take all the aspects of machine learning, and this is just a picture from one of our researchers, not meant to be in detail, not meant for anyone to go poke at. They did a paper study using a new element that they conceived called a resistive processing unit. And they said as a paper study, it can get you four to five orders of magnitude for training neural networks, which is a hugely expensive task in AI. Four to five orders of magnitude. Now that becomes interesting, but how will that get actually implemented? I love the word that Dr. Cordova used on proof of concept. These are highly speculative. They require a longer roadmap than I'll say most industry would do by itself. I think academia gets motivated by the problems that industry can bring them. And government benefits because of both the number of people who get trained, who go out to create 
and innovate many other things, but also the science advances and the nation benefits. I go back to my original point, the nation benefits on the order of trillions of dollars in terms of this thing. So it's sort of a win-win-win if we can get these going, but on this collection of new problems at the intersection of data, compute, and cognitive computing. So I'll pause there and turn it back to Dr. Walt. Thank you, Dr. Krishna, uh, for articulating some of the uh, outstanding uh, challenges, but also the opportunities uh, for uh, potentially future ERC type types of uh, uh, constructs. So uh, 